The easiest way to make an athlete worse is to take away autonomy. Your most important job is not to get them faster or whatever have you, is to develop the joy of whatever pursuits they're doing. And if you can do that, like the rest takes care of itself. You can be good. To be good, you have to put in the work. What I would say is this, lots of easy running, occasionally go hard, very, very rarely go see God. Greetings, Internet. Welcome to the podcast, the podcast that has devoted many, many episodes to the subject of why it's important to do hard things, which just so happens to be the title of today's guest's latest book. His name is Steve Magnus, and if that name rings familiar, it might be because this marks his third but first solo appearance on the show, his first two accompanied by recent guest Brad Stolberg. For those unfamiliar, Steve is a former elite track and field athlete and elite track and cross-country coach turned author and world-renowned expert on performance. In addition, Steve consults on mental skills development for professional sports teams, including some of the top teams in the NBA, and has also coached numerous professional athletes to the Olympics and world championship level. And alongside Mr. Stolberg, he pens the Growth Equation newsletter and co-hosts the podcast of the same name. Today, we're gonna deconstruct a new approach to unlocking true toughness, both physical and mental resilience, We're gonna talk about how to lead others to optimal performance and the path to unlocking the potential that resides within all of us. We also discuss Steve's background as a running prodigy and 401 miler, what he learned from his frustrated ambition to break the lauded four minute barrier, as well as the healthy mind, body, spirit approach to getting the best out of ourselves and those under our tutelage or leadership. And, Really for the first time, Steve quite candidly opens up with many never before publicly disclosed thoughts on his experience working under disgraced coach Alberto Salazar at the Nike Oregon Project and walks us through what ultimately led him to blow the whistle on Salazar's illegal doping activities. I really enjoyed talking to Steve. This one is a combination of just great stories as well as actionable takeaways. So please click that subscribe button. And here we go. This is me and Steve Magnus. It's good to have you here. I'm excited to talk to you. It's interesting that you're here the same week that the episode with Brad went up because we've done multiple uh, conversations with the two of you together, but this is my first crack at just getting you alone. Um, So much to talk to you about. The new book is called Do Hard Things. It comes out June 21st, right? So that's very exciting. Your fourth book? Yes. Four books. Yeah, that's the, pretty wild. Yeah. And on the heels of of retiring as a collegiate track and field coach at University of Houston, where you've been for quite some time. Yeah, nine years. So mm-hmm. quite a change. Mm-hmm. How does it feel to no longer be under in the academic fold? It's freeing and strange. So freeing because like you're out of this kind of bureaucracy that kind of controls your schedule and what you do, Uh but also strange because it was my life for so long that it like kind of grounded. Well, it dovetails into some of the themes in the book, this idea around agency and, and having the ability to, you know, kind of control your destiny that are so tied to um, our ability to be resilient and, and successful. Yeah, it really does. And it's, it was interesting writing the book while making this decision. Like it was almost this surreal moment where I'm like, oh, I wrote about this. I talked about how to navigate these situations Uh where you have like one part of you pulling you to be like, oh, stay like this is your life. And the other part pulling you to be like, you know, this is you can be free, Mm -hmm. like explore this. Right. You got to you got to you got to walk your talk. Yeah. You know, if you're going to be espousing this message. So here we are, though. Exactly. Yes. You had agency to get on a plane this morning and and come here and fly back to Houston tonight, which is its own endurance event. Uh, that's right. You know, still got that. Might not be as fast as I once was, but still got the mindset, right? Yeah. Well, I thought we could take an opportunity to kind of dive into your personal background in a little bit more depth, because although we've touched on it in our other conversations, A, those conversations were a long time ago. 
Uh, and secondly, they've always just been, you know, in the context of something else that we've talked about. So we haven't really heard your full story. So why don't we just begin with you as this high school track and field prodigy and what went right and what went <laughs> wrong? <laughs> yeah, this, let's go all the way back to what I call the beginning, which is I ran really fast in high school. And I ran really fast actually early in high school. So when I was a freshman, I ran 421 in the mile, which at that time was like the second or third fastest freshman in the country. Mm. And I wasn't very good in junior high. I ran track, but I mostly played soccer. So I, I got thrown out onto the stage of like, oh my gosh, people expect things of me. Mm. But well, how did that leap take place so quickly? You know, I think it was just kind of a bless of puberty hitting. And then like, I actually trained. So I got kind of taken up uh, like under the wing uh -huh. of some of the older athletes who said like, hey, Steve, like if, you, if you're gonna run cross country, like you should train. And I didn't train at all. Like I didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So I remember the first run that I did with one of these senior athletes who said, hey, we're gonna go run five miles. And I was like, five, five miles? Like I ran a, a mile and a half race in track and that's the furthest I've ever run. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you'll be all right. Uh -huh. I get to three miles, I stop, I throw up and tell him like, I'm walking home, this sucks, I'm done. And he said, Steve, you can be good. To be good, you have to put in the work. Uh -huh. And that just kind of stuck with me where I was just like, all right, I guess I'm gonna try and be good at this thing called running. And it just kind of carried on. So from, from that moment of throwing up in the midst of a five mile run to running 423 or whatever it was that year, like how much time had elapsed? So that was maybe about five months, somewhere That's in it. That. But That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, so I mean, I just skyrocketed. Every single race yeah. I got better, 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 better. It just came kind of naturally. Uh huh. Because I was training, I was competing. The coaches were just like, I remember again, my freshman year, this was, this was let's say 1999, 2000. So a high schooler hadn't broken four since like the 1960s. Mm. And I remember my high school coach pulled me aside and said, Steve, you have the opportunity in a couple of years where I think you can break the four minute barrier. And I, I was like, I'll know what that is. And he said, go home and look up Jim Ryan. So I go home on like the, the dial up internet mm -hmm. and look up who Jim Ryan is. I'm like, holy crap, like this guy ran 355 in the mile in high school. Like my coach thinks I can be kind of like this guy, okay. Let's go. Did you have a coach who knew what he was doing? Yeah, I did. Uh, he ran and I had two coaches, one who ran in college. So he was familiar with distance running. And the one had been a track coach for like 20 years, but coached sprinters and mm -hmm. elite level sprinters um, at the high school level. But he didn't know anything about distance running, but he was just like, I'm gonna help you out. I'm gonna right. I'm gonna learn as much as I can because I think we've got this phenomenal. Right. Talent. So these two guys are like, we got something special here. We gotta up our game yes. and try to see what we can make of this young Steve Magnus. Yes. And fast forward to you being a senior. So see the the funny thing is I skyrocketed and then for the next couple of years I stagnated. So I my best mile going into my senior year was I think around 417. Mm -hmm. So only small improvements. And then my senior year, I just hit that magic again, where every race I got faster, 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 until I ran a, a 401 mile on the biggest stage at the Nike Prefontaine Classic against, you know, Bernard Lagat, who was a, the fastest person in the world at that time, uh -huh. and all these, these phenomenal athletes. Right. The goal, however, being to go under four. It, it, and it drove me nuts because I ran 401 there. I ran 401 um, in another high school meet. I ran 403 somewhere else. So I was always knocking at the door. Uh -huh. And I thought, gosh, I'm so close. Like this is here. But in the back of my mind, I always, I, I just kind of knew. I said, you know what, if I don't get it, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crush this thing in college. This is no big deal. Right. Like I'm at the beginning. But. I didn't. Yeah. So that 
401 mile in high school remained the fastest time that I ever ran. Right. And looking back at that period of time in your life with all the coaching experience that you have today, do you sort of cycle through, I should have done this, I could have done that, why didn't I do this? For, and how much of that is related to you writing these books about, you know, how to approach your goals in a healthier and, and you know, more robust way? For a long time, that 401 and not 350 something really bothered me because running was my thing. It was what I got known for. It was what I was good at. It was what I saw other people have expectations for me on. So my secret weapon was always hard work. So I just work harder, harder, harder. Mm -hmm. And if things didn't go well, I just doubled down on that. So looking back, uh, absolutely. Which is natural. That's yep. a natural response. A natural response. But I think looking back, I'd say almost all of these, the books that I've written have had some like origin in the fact that I ran 401 right. and not 359. If only if, yeah, like sort of premise. It, yeah. And it it's not so much that now that I want to go like back and do this, I almost think the best thing that happened to me was not breaking that barrier because it forced me to come to terms with something, which is I was narrowly focused and my entire world was running. And in college, especially as I was trying to break that barrier, if a race didn't go well, I was devastated. Mm -hmm. My world was crushed. There was no separation between identity and performance. Zero. It was, if I ran 405, it was, Steve, you are a failure. Like, you yourself are a failure. And that yeah. was that was really difficult to wrestle yeah. with. Yeah, and your academic career was really just an excuse to continue to train. I've heard you speak about, like, you weren't really all that tapped into whatever you were doing at school. And even graduate school was just basically a way to get your parents off your back so you could keep training. Yeah, so, it, exactly. So, after I finished my undergrad, I kind of bummed around for six months and just like literally bummed around, like lived off the the small savings I had and trained. Mm -hmm. And after about six months, my parents are like, Steve, you have to do something with your life. <laughs> like you're <laughs> smart, you're driven, you got to do something. Uh huh. So how did you find your way into coaching? So it was it was pretty much, I went to grad school so that I could buy myself time to keep training and figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. And then... I found my way into coaching because at when I was in right before grad school, the high school coach I had had retired and they didn't have a new coach and they were gonna fill a coach, but they just kind of took their time as all high school coaches did. And it was the summer and I was back home training, like living with my parents, bumming around, figuring out what to do. Mm -hmm. And I trained at the like one park in the suburbs of Houston that everyone trained at. And I had all these high school kids who are like, we have no direction. They haven't hired a coach. Like, can you help us out? And I was like, all right, sure. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of really dedicated and great kids. And helping them out is what launched me into coaching because I was like, this is fun. Mm -hmm. Like I'm getting to give back. And, and at that time I had not as much awareness, but just enough self-awareness where I could be like, you know, here's a couple of really talented kids who had the who had the the talent to make it on the college and maybe even beyond level. And maybe I can pass along some wisdom so that they they can like course correct away from the path that I took. Mm, interesting, because another response to that that I wouldn't judge you for would be like, I don't want anything to do with running anymore. Like I, I didn't achieve my goals and you could kind of grind on that resentment and just move in a completely different direction. Yeah, I, I, I think that was, that would have been a legitimate option. And I think in some ways running was the only thing I knew because I just, I did well in school, but I didn't care at, at all about anything right. else. Nothing else piqued my interest. The, the coaching and the kind of exercise science and psychology piqued my interest, probably out of selfish reasons at mm -hmm. first to understand. But like, that's the only thing where I was like, oh, this might be interesting. Yeah. 
So it starts out with you just of your own accord and goodwill helping out these high school kids. But how does that, you know, position you to end up as this elite guru of track and field? <laughs> I honestly, you know, I, I, it's almost like I have no idea because it happened so fast. Uh-huh. Um, I started coaching high school kids. And then at the same time, I was like, well, I'm learning a lot. I'm just going to put out like in, in those days, like 2010. I was like, I'm going to put out a blog online. Mm. And I just start writing about like the science and I was in grad school and I'm, the coaching and kind of, you know, intertwining each and talking about the lessons learned. And that did fairly well. And then I think really that started is I was finishing up grad school. I was debating whether I should finish early, which I, I could if I pressed a class and my, my thesis or stick around and bum around for another semester and kind of keep it going so that I could delay my real life. Uh huh. And then I get a call out of the blue from Alberto Salazar. So you went straight from blogger helping out high school kids to Nike Oregon Project. Yes. I mean, that's, that doesn't happen, no. right? <laughs> like that's, that's wild. And you didn't have any real coaching credentials. No. And you weren't a superstar as a runner. You flamed out in high school. So what what do you think uh, sort of alerted Alberto that you would be a good candidate to join his his project, which we're going to get into? But so aside from all the nonsense, <laughs> yeah. what he told me at the time, <laughs> and looking back, I think I'd answer this question differently. But I'm going to give you my my at the time moment is that. He read something that I wrote and he referenced it. It was like on some, you know, analyzing some training of some elite Ethiopians mm -hmm. and Kenyans. And he was like, this is great. We're looking for an assistant coach with some science background to come in and like help me out. Are you interested? And I was like, 100%. And to me at that time, I thought I had hit like the jackpot. Mm-hmm. I thought I was like, this was a dream job right away. This is something that I thought maybe, maybe if I worked hard could occur like 20 years in the future. Right. So I was, I was all, all in from all day in. one. Yeah. And so you just pack your bags, move to Eugene. Portland. Portland. Yeah. Yes. Portland. Sorry. And, uh, and hence began this very interesting chapter of your life. It only lasted about a year and a half but it impacted my entire life for the next, you know, well, it's been 10, 11 years. Right. So, so much has been well-documented about what happened with Alberto Salazar and the Nike Oregon project. We don't have to rehash all the dirty details of all of that. Um, but I do want to give you an opportunity to share your perspective on what went down. I mean, you've been interviewed, you testified, so there's quite a bit of public record out there about this. And as we were chatting before the podcast, at the same time, you've done a really good job of not, of not allowing, you know, this identity of you as a whistleblower in that context to, to define who you are or the work that you do, which, you know, that befalls a lot of people who have the audacity or the courage to step out and, you know, publicly denounce something that they see uh, that is, you know, not so good. Yeah, I was, I would, I think the, I've handled it that way because I was keenly aware of what happens when your identity is like one thing because of my running. And I remember thinking about this before I blew the whistle is like, this is the thing, like this could completely define who you are and you'll have no control over it. And so I've tried to be like conscious and aware of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it. I've tried to be intentional. Right. So for people who who are perhaps not that familiar with what happened, maybe walk through the evolution uh, around you becoming aware that you know things were not as they seemed. Yeah. So early on, as I said, I thought it was my dream job, but, and I think that's an important framing because when you go in with that mindset, what happens is you start to. Like you look on the bright side of everything. So early on, I'd see some items that I was like, huh, that's kind of weird. 
Like what would be an example of that? Very early on, like, I remember it was a couple months after I got there and um, one of the athletes had to use some prescription drug after a race. And they had said it was asthma related, right? And then there was, Alberto started freaking out because he said, well, this drug isn't allowed in competition and the athlete was about to race again mm. days later. So I get a call from Alberto and he says, Steve, I need you to pick up a sample of pee from this athlete, fly it to Minnesota, drop it off, and they're going to test it to see if it contains the drug. And this was to transpire days in advance of a certain race. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he was like, if it doesn't, no race. If it does, he won't. We'll pull him out. And was that drug prescribed at the behest of Salazar? So this is the other interesting part that I, I again, realized kind of early on, but kind of excused away is that a lot of the doctors who helped the team and then Salazar, who was in charge of it, the relationship was like almost intertwined where there's several cases where Alberto would be like, this athlete needs this, which was a prescription drug, which as a non-doctor, like he shouldn't be able to, like mm -hmm. he's not a doctor, he can't do that. Or there'd be cases at the track where it'd be like, here, you need to take this. And then he'd hand someone a prescription bottle of someone else or give someone else like a prescription inhaler that didn't belong to them, that wasn't prescribed to them. So it was like a bunch of this, these things that push beyond like the normal, like right. doctor patient, like, you know, workings. And you're just making mental notes of these little incidents that are happening in, 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 you know, out in the open. Yeah. Relatively within the, within the ecosystem of this team. Right. And that, and that's kind of what it was. And then I think the first time my alarm bell went off is I was looking through a scientific research report done by the, the man who was formerly the head of the Nike Sports Science Lab. Mm -hmm. And I'm just perusing through it. It's on like altitude training. And I see this, the, the doctor's notes, the scientist notes, and it, it says under Galen Rupp's name, it says presently on testosterone medication. And as someone who's not esteemed and, and, and not a doctor, but I know when testosterone medication yeah. comes in, I'm like, you're like, huh, oh, this is weird. And this so what weird. do you do with that information? I'll tell I mean, initially I called my parents for advice. I'll be honest. Cause I was like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. This is strange. Like I know testosterone's illegal. Like, what do I do? And they're like, well, you got to confront Alberto. Right. Maybe there's an exemptive use authorization here. You don't really know what you're dealing with at this point. Exactly. So I like get up the courage because Alberto's, yeah, you know, my boss, intimidating guy. And I'm just like, talk myself through it. And I walk in there and I'm just like, hey, Alberto, I need to ask you a question. And he like turns around in his, his kind of desk and he was like, okay, what is it, Steve? What is it? I was like, I noticed this. Can you explain this? And he goes, he kind of is taken aback. And then he goes, oh, you know, that Lauren Myrie, like he's, he's crazy. He's died. He's losing his mind. Like, I don't know what this note is. Like, I don't know. Like, you know, I'll you go take it down to the lab and see if they have an explanation. And I Lauren go, being the sports, sports scientist. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I take it down the lab and they're like, I, I mean, I can, we can look through his old notes and see that. And I'm like, okay, I'd appreciate that. I just want to know. And that was, that was the last I heard of him. Mm. Never got an answer. Right. At some point, 
Alberto convinces you to hook yourself up to an L-carnitine IV drip for a four-hour period. So <laughs> help me understand this and, and why that was kind of a seminal moment in, in this process of wrapping your brain around what was actually happening. So this is... This was my biggest regret. And it's still hard to like think about how, oh, I was this person who did this. And what it was was simple. Is that Alberto had found, found some supplement that was made in the UK that had L-carnitine that you drank. But it took like three months to work because mm -hmm. you needed enough to build up in the muscle. Well, Alberto was a very impatient person and we had people on the team who were getting ready for the Olympic trials and the marathon. And he said, we don't have three months. We need to figure out a quicker way. So L-carnitine isn't a banned substance. Not a banned substance. But administering it via IV is a dubious exactly. question mark. Yeah. So what happened is the better way, which they can talk, concocted with scientists and the team doctor and all this stuff was, we're gonna inject it so that it's not like drinking the thing. It'll work pretty much right away. And then we'll be good and we'll do all this stuff. Well, it was, it was a procedure that hadn't, hadn't been done before, mm -hmm. to my knowledge, in this way at least. So I get a call right before Thanksgiving where Alberto says, Steve, how do you wanna go? Do you feel like going home for, for Thanksgiving? I was like, yeah, I'd love to go home for Thanksgiving. I said, great. Dr. Brown, who was the team doctor, lives in Houston. He was my personal doctor since the age of like 15. Uh -huh. Because he's in Houston and that's who I got referred to. So I'm like, okay. And he's like, we're going to do this procedure on you to test if this works. And if it works, then we're going to use it on all the athletes. And this is after the testosterone Galen yeah. Rupp thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. So at first I was like, this sounds really strange. I don't know about this. So I called Dr. Brown up again, my personal doctor. I said, is this safe and legal? And he said, yeah, it's safe. It's legal. We're going to do it the right way. I'll take your blood and we'll make sure every, you're healthy. And I was like, I don't know about this. He goes, it's safe. It's okay. And I just gave in and I said, okay, mm -hmm. I'll do it. And it's hard in that moment, it's hard to look at myself and be like, what were you doing? Like, who are you? Like you wouldn't do, you wouldn't take it, sit there and take an injection for, or for four hours in a doctor's office. But yet I did. And I think a lot of it was, I so wanted this job to be real. I trusted the guy who was my personal physician to look out for my health. And then the other aspect of it that I haven't really talked about is that Alberto was really good at figuring out what athletes wanted or what people wanted and needed and then using that. So what do I mean? What I mean by that for myself is throughout my time there, he would bounce back and forth between Steve, you're doing a phenomenal job. I'm going to give you like a three-year contract and a huge raise. And I'd be like, ecstatic. Let's do it. Like, great. I'm going to be, and then he'd be like, Steve, you're going to be the next person who takes over after I retire in a couple of years. Mm. He's saying, this is yours. You're going to be in charge of the best distance runners on the planet. Yeah, it's intoxicating. And I said- And you're oh. like, what, 25 at this yeah. point or something? Yeah, 25. Yeah. But then he would do the opposite every once in a while, where he'd say, Steve, I'm going to cut your, your, your contract down. You're going to be six months. You got to prove yourself. And he'd go back and forth. And right before this L-carnitine thing, there's a, there was this period that went from the beginning and then through this, through the L-carnitine thing, where I didn't receive a paycheck for six months. How is that? 
I can't tell you how it occurred, but I had a contract with Nike, biggest, you know, right. athletic company, but I didn't get paid for six months. And I'd ask Alberto and he'd be like, oh yeah, they're just going through details. We changed some con- some stuff. So it, it'll come through, it'll come through. And I'd be like, so I'd be like, okay, it'll come through. A month would we'd go by, I'd ask again. And this went on until, you know, right before I left. And periodically they'd be like, oh, Steve, do you need a loan? Mm. I'll give you a personal loan to hold you through. All these, all these mechanisms to create dependency and enhance his ability to control you, which exactly. is really that abuse cycle. Like you have, you, you give the love and then you, with, you withhold it and you create a circumstance where you're stuck. Exactly. And looking back, that's what I see now. When you're in it, sure. You yeah, can't see you it. You can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, that's heavy, man. That's heavy. I mean, clearly he must have had something to do with the withholding of your salary. Do you think there was an intentional act on his part to, so that he could be the puppet master? I think so. Mm -hmm. And even also stepping back, identifying you with that decision to hire you. It's like, oh, this guy's bright and young, but also he doesn't know anything. Like I can control this guy. He can be my, you know, lieutenant and he's going to do what I tell him to do. A hundred percent. And you look at it also as their team doctor was my personal doctor. Right. So there's all these like things there where it's like, I used to think, as I said, at the beginning, I was like, oh, he identified me. I, I wrote something great, blah, blah, blah. But the reality is I was a young guy who hadn't had experience, who would see this as his dream job, who was admittedly a running nerd, right? Mm -hmm. Who fell short in his own career and has this opportunity. And he probably thought I can manipulate the hell out of him, right? Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly. And because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious, and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. So there you are back in Houston, hooking an IV up to your arm. Yeah. So explain what L-carnitine is and what it did to you. So it's amino acid that essentially the research shows it, it helps us be more efficient in the fuel that we utilize. Mm-hmm. So simple terms, burn less carbohydrates, so that you can save those in something like the marathon. So it makes a, a relatively, I mean, a big effect. Right, and and your experience personally after this four hour drip, I mean, you you said like you felt like superhuman. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember it is, I, I did testing on the treadmill, like in the lab before and after my numbers shut up. And then just to see what happened, I got thrown in a workout with Dathan Ritz and I, one of the best American males ever. And he's doing a, a long marathon pace tempo run at like 
five minute pace or faster. Mm -hmm. And I run 11 out of the, I think, 14 miles with him. And I'm not compete like, right. You're I'm coaching not, at this point. Yes. I'm not, I'm not in that shape. I went through 10 miles faster than I'd ever run 10 miles. Wow. And I felt fine. I could have, and I remember having this conversation because it was before the Olympic trials. I could have qualified for the Olympic trials. No question asked like the next day if I needed to. That's wild. So with that realization, how do you arrive at this place, at this place where you, you're prepared to say something publicly or to report to somebody it, what you're seeing? First, it took the guts to leave where I was like, this is crazy. I feel like, and I remember telling my parents this and they, I said, I feel like I'm in a cult. Cause it's not just like these shady stuff over there. It's also like the shady stuff with like how they treated like Kara Goucher and Amy Bagley and all these others. And I was just like, this is manipulative as hell. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause on top of that, anybody who listened to the episode I did with Mary Kane, she yeah. talks about, you know, the head game aspect of this, which is the other piece. It, and that's, I remember this, this was right before I, I, I left, but I got pulled into a meeting and Alberto is going over athlete stuff and he pulls out an athlete. We're talking about is Alberto Darren Treasure, who was like called the sports psychologist and me. And they're going over the athletes. They pull out one athlete and this athlete had just made their first world championship team. And he goes, she's too fat. Her butt's so big, she can't lift her legs. And in my head, I'm like, just made her first world championship team. Mm -hmm. Like she's PR and all left and right. I'm like, I'm like, okay, let me look at the data. Cause that's who I am, a science data guy. I pull out the data, body fat testing using the gold standard like measurement. And it was something like 10, 11%, mm -hmm. which is about as low as you can get as a female. Mm -hmm. And I say, hey, here's the data, Alberto. Like, it's fine. You can't go any lower. And he turns to me and says, I don't give a damn what the science says. I know what I see with my eyes. She needs to lose weight. And then Darren, Darren like sees the controversy, butts in and is like, well, maybe instead of saying lose weight, why don't we give an example of, of what she should look like? And Darren goes, she should look like, how about Jenny Simpson, who was at, at the time the world, like coming off being the world champion in the 1500s. And Alberto goes, Jenny's too fat. Whoa. So in that moment, I knew no science matters, no data matters, nothing else matters except the perception in Alberto's head. Mm -hmm. And as weird as it sounds, I remember thinking like, this is like, I can't, do what I need to. I can't support this. I got to get out of here. Mm. Which is a pretty bold realization and move for somebody so young. And this is really your first job. You had to, you know, imagine, is he going to blackball me? Is this going to prevent me from being able to go coach somewhere else? How did you like handle the departure? I tried to handle it well. And initially it seemed like it was going well. We had a conversation. It was somewhat civil. I was like, okay, I'm not going to hold you back. You're young. Like, just get out. That's fine. It's a great. A couple of days later, Alberto flips completely, gets angry, starts sending these emails, one of which literally threatens black, like blackballing, telling me, because I was like, he was like, what are you going to do? I said, I think I'm going to go coach in college. And he said, fine, great. A couple of days later, he says, Steve, remember that Nike sponsors the vast majority of college track teams, college sports teams. So keep that in mind on what you want me to say to them. Wow. The reign of terror. So like that's how it, it left. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
That's terrifying. So how do you, how do you, uh, you know, get the gumption to speak out? Was there some other incident or act that occurred that crossed the line enough where you were like, I can't, I can't sit on this information anymore? I went home to Houston. I was fortunate. I got the college job, cross country job at Houston, which was my alum. So I knew the head coach. I knew it was going to be fine, but I tried to put it behind me. I didn't want to talk about it. I declined all interviews. I didn't want to speak about it. I just wanted to move on. And that's what I tried to do. I saw the Olympic Games. I saw two Oregon Project athletes go one, two. That was hard to watch because I knew behind the scenes what was going on. And then I saw that Alberto was in discussion with coaching this high school phenom named Mary Kane. And I remember at that time, no one, like the people who knew anything about it was essentially my, my family and my best friend. Mm -hmm. And I remember calling up my best friend and being like, who's also ran in with in college and said, this is going to be an utter disaster. Because Alberto treated grown women like shit. I couldn't imagine a high school kid going into that environment, having those expectations, and being in that situation. In my head, I was like, I was 25, and it was... I couldn't handle that at all. And it was like the worst decision I ever made. This is going to be an utter disaster. Which is exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So off of that, I called USADA. Well, I, I, I sent them an email. Didn't tell anybody I was going to do it. All my parents and they said, don't, you don't want to whistle blow. They actually had a, a, a Texas like judge, a well-known judge, called me up and, and walked me through what would happen most likely if I blew the whistle mm -hmm. and if I didn't. And he said, look, it's probably the right thing to blow the whistle, but I've been behind the bench for 30 years and this could potentially ruin your life and get no benefit or change out of this. <sighs> So no one right. want with Nike behind it, yes, and unlimited resources to just upend your life. Yep, and yet you still went through with it. Yeah, I mean it ate away it 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 ate away at my soul. I tried to push it away. I tried to ignore it, but it just ate at me until the point I just remember thinking. Whatever happens, at least if nothing good comes out of this, at least people will know and then they can make the decision that you didn't have that opportunity to make because you had no knowledge there was nothing out there. Mm -hmm. So I wrote up an email in five minutes, hit send, and that started. That basically thing. said what? It was like a two-paragraph email that outlined... Hey, I saw this document that said testosterone. I know they're doing L-carnitine injections. There's a lot of sketchy stuff going on. I suggest you investigate them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who was that email addressed to specifically? It was the just, you saw it like, like go tip to their line. website. Oh yeah, wow. I went to their uh -huh. website. They have a tip line, and I I just sent it in. Yeah, and what's interesting is you had enough foreknowledge to know what you were getting into. It wasn't like a spontaneous, like, I'm just going to send this off and I'm not going to worry about it. Like you knew that potentially there was a hurricane coming in your direction. So how long before this kicked up a kerfuffle? So it started, it was behind the scenes. It was a lot. Because USADA would interview me and call me all the time and randomly and all this stuff. And then reporters at this time, within about six months, they're starting to kick the can. 
They're starting to call me being like, hey, I'm here. But they're hearing it from somewhere else. Somewhere else. else. Yeah. I'm hearing something, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And for the longest time, I just said, nope, nope, nope. Not going to do anything. But I remember Dave Epstein called me. And this was after a year of kind of USADA. And USADA was interesting because it was like firestorm of activity, four months of nothing. Firestorm of activity, nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. And Dave was the first person who I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to Dave. He was with ProPublica at the time yes. before all his books and all of that. Yes. Yeah. So I started to tell Dave, he worked with the BBC. And that's when I knew they were like, hey, we have behind the scenes, they said, hey, we've got Kara Goucher, other people telling our story. And I hadn't talked to Kara. And I was intentional, actually, during the almost 10 years that this came out to really not talk to Kara. And I remember thinking, okay, if Kara's gonna like do this as well, then the story needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And that, once it started going down this path, and USADA was aware that I was talking to Epstein, Once it started going down this path, I knew that as soon as this came out, it was gonna be a firestorm. It was gonna be, like I had to be prepared. And then specifically, I remember being at a track meet, uh, a Diamond League track meet, so big time track meet. And in the warm up area, because I was there with the athlete, Alberto comes around, comes up to me and says, Steve, did you see anything while you were here? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, Alberto. He's like, I'm hearing reports like some rumblings of something. I said, I don't know what you're talking about, Alberto. And I just walked off. And I knew that I had to prepare for like the chaos that was mm-hmm. coming. In other words, he's telegraphing to you. I know what you're up to. Just so you know, I know. Yes, Mm -hmm. exactly. Right. And how long before the press really cottons onto this and the big stories break? Or did that happen with the the legal proceedings? So it happened, I think the, I think I blew the whistle at the end of 2012. And then somewhere in around 2014, 2015 is when it all blew up in the Mm -hmm. press. Mm -hmm. And that was when the, the, chaos started but before that like i didn't know what was going to happen it had to be terrifying it it i had to come to terms with that i would never work in running and never coach again that's what i had to wrap my head around Mm -hmm. and we we talked at the beginning i've had four books the first book science of running which was self-published i put it out there right before the original like piece was supposed to come out. Mm-hmm. As a prophylactic, like just so you know, before I head into this, I actually know what I'm talking about with running and maybe there'd be some kind of insurance policy for your career. Exactly. Yeah. So that I had something else financially, expertise wise, something else that I was like, okay, if this all goes to hell in a handbasket, I'll be okay for a while to figure out what the next path is. Mm-hmm. How bad did it get? I mean, did you were did they have people following you? Were they digging up, trying to dig up dirt on you and publishing false accounts in the press of who you were? Like, what was your lived experience of that period? I mean, it was uh, I had to get off the internet, which is much harder than you realize it yeah. it is <laughs> in the modern world. Uh-huh. But it was driving me nuts because yeah, there'd be a bunch getting of getting dragged, getting dragged in the yeah. press getting dragged wherever I'd show up to track meets and, and literally other coaches would be like, Hey Steve, like good to see you, but I don't want to be near you. Mm -hmm. And I'd be like the ostracized like person over in the corner because Nike is the biggest thing in track and field. Right. And it was, I mean, at that, I had the, the FBI show up at 
my house. I had reporters literally stalk me at my house and at my work. Oh, that's so crazy. All leading up to, of course, this pinnacle moment of you testifying with Alberto sitting right there. It's the, the hardest thing I've ever done was not blowing the whistle. It was sitting there in that room. It, I never, I thought I knew kind of what a panic attack was, but I didn't know until experiencing that. Mm. Cause I remember sitting there being like, oh my dear Lord, like I'm about to like have to share everything, get grilled, etc. They're going to try and tear me apart. And it was nerve wracking. Like I'm an introvert by nature. Mm -hmm. I, I like to write. I don't like, I do get up and talk, but it's not, it's not my, my, you know, my thing. So it was the worst experience of my life. I wouldn't wish anybody else to have that. Yeah. To have him sitting there. I mean, was he just steely eyeing you the whole time? And and what was the experience of being cross-examined in that context? Well, horrible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, they're just staring you down and trying to, trying to like poke any sort of hole, twist, any sort of thing you've done or said at any moment in basically the history of your, your life. Right. It's throwing whatever sticks at the wall. And here you are in your head, you're like, that didn't happen. Like, what in the world are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, this is BS. But like, you, all you can do is say that. And they try and confuse everything. Because you got to remember at the time of this stuff, it's, it's all stuff that happened five, six, seven, you know, by the end of it, nine years ago, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. We're and you only actually saw a couple of incidents, right? So it's not like you were, you know, down in the basement with whatever doctor he was working with and really had, you know, hands-on firsthand accounts of all kinds of stuff. So it's, it, you could see how they could pick that apart and create doubt. Exactly. It's not like I had the smoking gun where I saw someone like inject themselves with a steroid mm -hmm. and took a picture of it. Like I didn't, right. I didn't do that. So because it was so nuanced and because again, you're looking at people in the panel who maybe don't have the expertise to understand what high level sport and the science behind it and all this stuff. And what is illegal and what isn't. It, exactly. And what's normal and what's not normal in sport, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that, that was really hard because I'm sitting here being like, no, you guys like, this is crazy. This is not normal. Like this doesn't occur anywhere else, but like to convey that is something else. Right. Well, you did the thing and what happened happened. And in the wake of that, have you had any direct correspondence with Salazar? Like, has he reached out to you? Has he tried to contact you? No, no, mm -hmm. no. I mean, those guys never. Yeah. And what about when you bump bump into Nike people at track meets and things like that. I mean, before all the verdicts came, they'd try and intimidate me. Yeah. But have they cleaned house since then? So it's new and different people? They have for the most part. Not entirely, but a lot of them uh -huh. are different and gone. So it's 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 just strange, yeah. honestly. Because yeah. In my head, I'm sitting there being like, look, I'm not trying to ruin anyone's life or do anything. Like, I'm just telling you what I saw. Uh huh. Right. And with that, with having had that experience and then coaching at the elite, you know, collegiate level and being at all these meets and knowing these athletes firsthand, when you're watching the Olympic trials or some big track meet and you see exceptional performances, like what goes on in your mind? Like we all want to believe that sport is clean, um, but you knowing better than anyone, like what constitutes a legitimate breakthrough versus an enhanced breakthrough? Like, are you cynical? Like how do you, what is your lens on, <laughs> on sport 
not just in track and field, but like, you know, we could talk about psych, we could talk about yeah. any of the sports in which this is rampant and there's been controversies. For a while, I was very cynical. And I realized that it was killing my love of something that I really enjoy doing, participating mm -hmm. in, helping out in. And where I've come to now is I cheer on the folks and the coaches and the athletes who I feel really good about, who I think are doing things the right way. And I can get maybe not to 100% certainty, mm -hmm. but I can get close. And those are the people I watch, I cheer for, et cetera. If you're not in that group, you set a record, I don't care. Right. And I'm not going to ask you to name those people, but <laughs> clearly I can tell there's certain individuals where you're like, okay, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's this, hard. It's with that, it has to be, I mean, it's a choice, but it still has to be a challenge for you to remain enthusiastic about the sport. It does. And it, the, you know, the hardest part to me though, is that there are a lot of people, I kind of thought maybe this was naive. I thought, okay, I'm going to blow the whistle. People will see all this. If it comes out, the verdict did in, in the favor of we were telling the truth that, well, people would see and they'd have like ethics and morals and back the good side. And mm -hmm. like, but you still see people who go to like, train with similar athletes or coaches as were part of the Oregon project or like, you know, kind of mesh in that environment. And in my head, I'm like, like, guys, you know, you've heard my story. You've seen the report. You've seen what Mary Kane went through and Kara Goucher. Mm -hmm. And there are people like, ah, like, oh no. Like, even though you're like a coach and an athlete at the time, like, I don't care. Like, We'll just blow this off. And that that drives me nuts. Right. But you can also have compassion for them. They're young people yeah. who are trying to have a professional career in a sport where there's very little money. And there is still a level of prestige attached to Nike and Oregon and all of that. And, you know, far be it from us to judge somebody who who kind of needs that in their in their life and, you know, has to find some way to look past past transgressions, you know, for the sake of their future career. I, I, I a hundred percent get that. And I think what it tells me or what I've realized is that I was very, it, it, we all come at it from like a naive perspective and you tend to think like ethics and morals and all those things are like hard grained, like in you and what mm -hmm. have you. But what I've realized is environment impacts you more than you realize, more than we account for. So I don't, I try my best not to blame people, not to be like, oh, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. Why did you choose that decision? Right, but you can reflect on your own decisions and why you made them exactly. at that time. And you know that I'm sure allows you to better understand. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I, I try to have nuance there where it's like, the world is not good and evil. It's not black and white. We're all capable of all sorts of good and bad decisions. And that's just reality. Right. And I would imagine in the way that you look back on that 401 mile and, and, and your inability to, to break that barrier as a gift that allowed you to become something greater, you can reflect back on that experience at, at Oregon Project and think, but not for that, you would have become the coach that you became at Houston. Like you, you could have just remained under Salazar's wing forever and never fully developed your own identity as a head coach. It, 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 it shaped how I see not only like coaching, but also life. Yeah, like what is really important here? Exactly. If you ask 25 year old Steve, he would say, oh, like Olympic medals, running around really fast in ovals. Mm -hmm. If you ask me after this experience, <laughs> It's no, it's I want healthy, happy human beings who can use sport as a way to challenge and push boundaries and like find themselves and like struggle and all those things. 
but we can do it in a way that like makes them grow as individuals. And if mm-hmm. we do that, like who cares if you run 401 or 355? Right. And that mission statement then begets all these questions. Well, if that's the priority, how do we make healthy, happy athletes who can thrive in a sustainable way? Hence all of these books that you've written and all the research that you've done and all of that, which is, you know, fundamentally why we're here today. Like I didn't know we were gonna spend a whole hour on <laughs> Nike Oregon Project, but thank you for for being so candorous about that because I think there is still this, you know, sh- it's it's interesting. We were talking before the podcast, like it's the story that doesn't go away. Like even though you're like 2012, but yet we're still talking about this because it kind of continues to evolve. And it also is a basis point for how we think about other controversies that are similar or analogous. And it like won't leave you on some level, despite your desire to put it in the rearview mirror. But I appreciate you, you know, being open about it. But let's turn this to to the new book, Do Hard Things, and kind of what you're, you know, really interested in, which is this idea of how do we cultivate not just um, great athletes who are resilient and you know capable of optimizing performance, but ultimately you know good human beings and the principles that you've learned as a coach that translate into the workplace and into our personal lives, et cetera. So um, maybe a good place to start while we're on the subject of running and the 401 mile is is really what what appears to be an impetus for this book, which is this other mile that you were running where you had this vocal cord incident that, you know, made you rethink, you know, your approach to stress and your approach to toughness in general. Yeah, yeah. So this happened when I was in college. I was, I was in the middle of a uh, a mile at, uh, at Cal Berkeley, running against some really good runners, trying to break the four minute barrier, was running really well. And then, all of a sudden, after three laps or so, I couldn't breathe. And when I say I couldn't breathe, like I literally could not get air in. Mm-hmm. And it sent me like, what in the hell is going on? I collapse on the ground. You know, I'm trying to figure out how to breathe. Eventually. And the way you describe it, sorry to yeah. step over your words, but the way you describe it is it's not that you were out of your your depth in terms of exertion, like you were pacing yourself and you felt like you were you know, hitting the mark that you needed to hit at that stage of the race. I think you had a lap and a half left or something like that. And you're like, I'm right where I need to be. So it wasn't like, oh, I've just overexerted myself or mis- misjudged my pace. It was something altogether different. Yes. It was as if someone had like, you know, shoved something down my throat and I was choking. That's the best way I can describe it. Mm. Not like there was just nothing that could get in or out of that passageway. And what it turned out to be after a lot of testing is is that it was this thing called vocal cord dysfunction, which is essentially what happens some or what normally happens is, you know, your vocal cords open when you breathe and shut when you don't, and they just kind of go back and forth. Mm. Um, for whatever reason, my vocal cords almost flipped where the stress signal told them to shut when they should be opened. And it's this really weird kind of disorder that is more common than we think, but it's often gets confused with asthma, even though it's like the opposite effect. Um, So what happens and what the research tells you is that it generally happens in driven, perfectionist type individuals who for whatever reason have some sort of trigger that like just almost makes the brain go haywire and have this opposite reaction. And what I had to learn to do from that is I was so accustomed to being like, well, how do you handle pain? You just push through, you dig deeper, you like grit your teeth and like put your head down and Mm -hmm. like go and push for it. And that would no longer work because if I did anything that caused any sort of anxiousness or tension in me, that became a trigger for my vocal cords literally shutting. And then I'd have to drop out and figure out how to breathe again. Right. So you're forced into this situation where you have to figure out a different way to avoid that response, which is going to require an antithetical relationship with pushing through pain. 
and more of a Eastern philosophical, you know, kind of letting go, surrender, mindful, mindfulness, you know, driven relationship with sport in order to avoid having that kind of an incident. Exactly. And for someone who grew up again in the South around like football and sport, that Eastern (laughs) philosophy didn't come naturally. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's just, it's not even like part of the parlance. And you get into this in the book um, around kind of our unhealthy, but, you know, conventional ideas around what it means to be tough in sport and these legendary stories of these mythic, you know, coach figures and athlete figures that have cemented this notion in our consciousness to the point where we don't even question it. Yeah. It, it, it's it's mm-hmm. kind of wild. It's like, I like to think like every society has their, and culture has their kind of like master narratives. In the US, it's like, oh, the American dream, like do all this thing. In sport, in toughness, in military, in all this stuff, the master narrative is one of like push through. Mm-hmm. Ignore the pain. Like, don't cry. Don't show any emotions. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you have story after story after story. And what's interesting is you deconstruct these, like beginning with Bear Bryant and him arriving at Texas A&M and this legendary, you know, fable around how he pushed these kids in their summer training camp leading into the fall, uh, where to the point where like most of them quit Right. But then two years later, they become this reigning champion team and the kind of mythos of Bear Bryant is born. And when you deconstruct it, you realize, well, this is all horseshit. Like, this isn't even actually what happened. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was one of my favorite. My yeah. wife, my wife might actually be upset with me because she's an a- Texas A&M grad. So it's like part of uh-huh. their mythos. But uh That, that was, you know, it's famous, especially in Texas, like junction boys is what it's called. Like go to the camp, do all this crazy stuff. This is how they got better. This is how they became, you know, the team that was legendary. And the reality is the year they go to the camp, they do all this crazy stuff. They went one in nine. Mm -hmm. The year they were good, only a handful of the players were actually left. What had happened is they'd gotten better players. How Brian admitted himself, like they paid to recruit better players to Texas A&M. But also the marketing hype of that story made it attractive, exactly. right? So you can you can create, you know, uh, this magnetic field out of this legend. Um, but the truth of it was that like a lot of the, like the freshmen by the time they were seniors weren't even, who, who had been there during that period of time, the stars opted out of the camp. <laughs> And some of the guys that quit the camp ended up being superstars in other fields. Like they were amazing individuals had they been sort of mentored, you know, in a, in a healthier, more appropriate way. Exactly. And I think that's what you see so much is that when we do things like, you know, throw people into the, the deep end and see if they survive, we lose so many good candidates. We're not developing people. Mm -hmm. And this is where it also ties into the military because people have taken it from there as they say, oh, the Navy SEALs, hell week. They go through all this this crazy stuff. That's a sorting exercise. That's not a development exercise. So explain the difference between those two things. So sorting is, is pretty simple. Is they're just trying to see, okay, can you go through this rigors so that we can select you to see if you can like, handle this job. Mm -hmm. So they're simulating. It's it's, it's literally the initial litmus test to see if you're even a candidate to be developed into what ultimately could be a Navy SEAL. It's like taking the SAT, Mm -hmm. right? We're going to create some sort of barrier and this will help us, right? But we mistook it and we took it as the development method, which if you go like people, coaches, parents, whoever, they think, oh, well, the, the, the way to develop discipline and toughness is take the Navy SEALs method, which is put people through some really difficult things, like, and then they'll get really tough. No, that's not what the Navy SEALs even do. Mm-hmm. If they're talking about developing toughness, they focus on more of what I'd call that Eastern side, as you mentioned earlier, which is like, hey, we've got we've to create space. Mm-hmm. We've got to develop the mental skills 
I talked to a, a really good um, athlete, former college athlete of mine who went on into the military and now is trying for the special forces. And he put it pretty su succinctly. It was like, Steve, before we go out and do all the crazy stuff, like the survival training that we're, we're doing, we sit in a classroom, we go, we have lecture after lecture, PowerPoint after PowerPoint. I've got a 600 page book filled with telling me how, what to do mentally and physically to handle whatever situation I'm coming at. And I have to learn and understand that. Yeah. And it's only after I learn those skills that I'm then put in a place that simulates what I'll feel like and experience so that I can try those skills out. Right, to see if you're able to access that skill set under pressure and duress. Exactly. Yeah. What's fascinating is, is how much the military gets right about this because it does dispel that, that kind of mythic notion of weeding out the weak and you know the toughest will survive and how um, kind of rooted in science and how um, kind of mature and, and well thought out it is. Like it is this blueprint where they've poured a ton of research and, and, and money and resources into trying to figure out how do you develop these skills that are so critical to having a robust defense, right? That is so different than what we think. And it, it reminds me of the, um, I did a podcast with this guy, Rich Davini, who was you know, basically training Navy SEALs. And he you know, echoed the same thing. It's like, it's all about developing mental resilience. Like the, those other things are just tests and they get a lot of press and they're fun to talk about. But the truth is much more complicated and nuanced and has to do with psychology and how do you inherently motivate somebody and and you know develop a team approach to problem solving and all this kind of thing. You know, I, I think the way I like to think of it is the public image is stuck in the 1940s military mm -hmm. and the actual military is like the nation's largest, you know, employer of sports psychologists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because they're they're just like no, we have to figure this out, and rightfully so. Because if you look at their own research, when like new, you know, soldiers, special forces, like guys who have already passed the test, come in, something like ninety four percent of them experience disassociation during simulated like survival training. Right. Which is disassociation is when your mind is kind of like slows down, cuts off, doesn't see reality for reality, you know, the fog of war. So they they see that and they're like, yeah, we got to get this right. Right. We need to understand how to prevent that from happening. How can we create uh, soldiers who won't disassociate and are able to maintain their ability to think clearly and respond rather than react when they're in those very challenging circumstances? Exactly. Which is exactly what you want out of athletes. That's exactly what you want to be able, the way you want to be able to comport yourself in other areas of your life where you're going to meet obstacles and duress. I, you know, and that, I think this is an important point is it's not just athletes. It's just not just soldiers. All of us need to be able to respond and not react in our daily lives. You know, how we handle parenting, how we handle leading, how we handle inevitable arguments with our spouse or children. Like it's, we've all lost our mind at some point, mm -hmm. but if you have the ability to respond and not just lash out, you're going to have a better outcome and a better decision from it. Right. So you explore this in the book and what's, what's great about it is you do it from the perspective of, of, the athlete or the individual, like here's how you can develop these capacities, but also from the perspective of the coach or the mentor or the leader who's charged with responsibility for cultivating that in people that they're collaborating with. Yeah. And I think that the most interesting part on all this is, you know, I love the in individual aspect, but on the team aspect or the organization or the cultural aspect, the same thing applies because it's like, Again, we hold on to this idea of like, oh, we want to create like resilient, disciplined people. We got to be like hard asses on yeah. them. And it's the exact opposite. Yeah. But yeah. 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 It's very counterintuitive. I mean, you, you know, you talk about Bobby Knight. He's like, these people get a lot of attention. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, 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 it, and so what happens is we start to think that that's the appropriate yes. or correct yeah. way to approach it. I mean, my, my collegiate swimming coach, 
I've told this story before. I can't remember whether I told it with you guys last time you were on, but he was a, he was a Marine sniper in Vietnam. He was a hard ass. And he, you know, definitely came from some version of the Bobby Knight school. And he would say, he said to me one time, like I was becoming very dispirited as a member of this team. And I was not putting points up on the board. Like I was meaningless in the, in the you know, equation of whether we were going to win an NC2A championship. Um, but I loved being on the team and my teammates were very important to me. And I saw a situation in which he was, he was, he was leading from a perspective of negativity and fear and he called me into his office one day because he could tell I was not happy with the speech that he had just given. And, and he just, he, you know, he wanted to know how I felt. And I just said, look, I, you know, I, I came up with a coach who, 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 was, who was positive and empowering, and I'm not used to this style of coaching. And he just said to me, if it takes this team hating me to win, then that's what we're going to do. And I just thought to myself, I'm not interested in, be in being on that team, <laughs> you know? And he had successful results. So as long as you're winning, you know, you can, you can like rationalize that type of behavior, but ultimately it's not sustainable and you're not gonna attract that kind of talent and great talent is not gonna wanna be tutored under that type of regime. Yeah, you know, fear is like lighter fluid. It looks really good. It looks like it works, but it like burns out and right. Bit. And and it and it may work in the short term. Yes, because you're running because fear is a very you know it, is a is a is a solid energy source. Yep. It just it just burns out quickly. Yes, I mean mm. it's it's our kind of most basic you know motivator, but it's what is it meant to do? It's meant to like get you to run away from the lion. Mm -hmm. It's not to sustain you over the long haul. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. So let's let's move from this wrong-headed idea around leadership and toughness into what you discovered as a result of, of reading this book. I mean, the book, first of all, it's I haven't said this yet, but it's fantastic. I think it's a, an, an amazing resource. Clearly, you put a ton, I, I mean, I don't know how you found the time to do all the research in this book because there's hundreds of stories and anecdotes from historical figures and of course, all that kind of research, scientific research that validates like this new perspective on how we should think about being tough, how to motivate ourselves and motivate the people, you know, in our charge. Yeah, you know, um, I love the research. So if it was up to me, it would probably be even more of that. Mm -hmm. But like, I got to tell the story to, to mm -hmm. keep it interesting, but I try to, balance that out. But you know, it's, it's no different than in my own running world is like, if I'm going to go at something, I'm going to go at it hard. So right. in this, like I wanted to be right. And when I'm making a claim that says, Hey, like all these ideas you thought were, were correct, maybe reevaluate it. I better come at you with like enough evidence. Yeah. You of course are aware that there's some kind of ironic joke built into that, right? Like the, the, this is the no pain, no gain, you know, like I'm just going to overtrain this book. <laughs> until it until it finally exists. Yeah, no, I'm as I'm, I'm, as I'm, I'm dying on the you know writing I'm, the acknowledgments uh, 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 at the end. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That's that's where friends and colleagues are uh -huh. and family are to pull me back from the brink. Right. So it's all premised on these four pillars. So maybe we can kind of you know walk through what those are and and you know why how you kind of came to think about resilience and are you using toughness and resilience somewhat interchangeably yes. here yeah as you know the pillars of like how to how to embody the this quality sure so i i think you know the first um one that i came with is that you kind of have to embrace reality and what does embrace reality mm -hmm. mean it's like false bravado looks good but it fails because like you need to have expectations and reality match up enough. So if I go into a marathon and I say, oh, I've got this, this is no big deal, et cetera. Whenever the pain actually hits, my brain's going to freak out. Right. And you're going to completely fall apart. Exactly. So it, it's like coming to terms with, it's okay to understand these are the demands of the event. This is what I'm currently capable of. And if you can do that and have the overlap there, mm -hmm. you're going to be in a much better place than if you had like bravado or whatever have you. 
right? Or the insecurity mm. of like, this is going to be a disaster and not acknowledging that you actually did a lot of work in preparing for this. So there's a sweet spot in there. And amidst all of that, you do have to have room to reach like, okay, here's my reality. I know the training I put into it. I know I have a, 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 an objective appraisal of how difficult this challenge is going to be. And then I still have to have permission to reach a little bit beyond that, right? Because this is the goal. Like we're, we're all trying to exceed what we think we're capable of doing, right? So how do those two things like work with each other? I like to see it. I'm going to use historical example here. If you look at Abraham Lincoln, he had what I'd call tragic optimism in the sense that he was, you read his speeches, he was so optimistic for the future. We're going to get this done. We're going to free slaves. Like we're going to change the country. We're going to get through this. But in the day to day, in the war, despair, despair. Yeah. And I'm not saying you need to take it to that extreme, but that's how I kind of see this, this embracing reality is you need to have hope for the future. You need to say, I'm going to stretch. I'm capable of, of more, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in the here and now, you got to have it kind of overlap where it's like, what am I facing? What do I have to do? What do I need to get through this period? Mm -hmm. Because as you say <clears throat> in this section, when you place yourself into that stressful situation, you will be exposed. Like your mask will come off, right? So so the more you've embraced the reality of what you're actually involved in, the less impact that stress will have on exposing your weaknesses because you've kind of appropriately prepared for that. Yeah, you come to terms with it. And biologically what happens is anytime our brain is kind of caught off guard, we tend to have a threat response because your brain wants you to survive, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime we're like prepared and it's kind of within our reach, we have a challenge response, which is more kind of testosterone adrenaline driven instead of cortisol threat driven. Mm -hmm. So when we look at, uh, when we think of like toughness, we often think of like, oh, just fake it, like put on a mask and you'll be good. But once that's exposed, like your brain's gonna jump to that freak out moment where it's like, oh crap, sound the alarm, like get out of here, escape, flight, don't take things on because like we're not capable. Right, so an example would be in an Ironman when somebody's leading on the bike and they get a flat, right? And then they, they're they all pissed off and they're throwing their bike and throwing a tantrum and they look they look tough because they're doing that, but actually that's weakness because they haven't prepared for that variable. And when it occurred, the stress reaction was to just like lose your mind or, you know, in a tennis match and you're throwing chairs because of a bad call or something like that. Yeah. And that's how most of these things happen is like from the, from the external side, it might look tough or it might look like you care. Right. And like, oh, look how pissed off he is. Like mm -hmm. he cares about his performance. But to me, like it's the opposite is like, well, you're just kind of sabotaging yourself. You're not prepared for the moment. You're not figuring your way through this, this stuff. And I, I think you can almost summarize the biology or the neuroscience of, of toughness down to, like we talked earlier about, can you keep your mind steady no matter what kind of chaos is going on around you? Mm -hmm. Can you keep your mind from defaulting towards that free act, freak out reactive state? Or can you keep you know, yourself online, rational, ability to work through things. And in the heat of the moment, the competitiveness, the competitiveness, like often what happens is we default to that freak out because it's like almost overwhelming. It's this like emotional charge behind it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And embracing reality is, you know, that's a, that's a piece here. There's so many other things yeah. that you have to practice in order to maintain your level of composure under that kind of stress. Um, but a lot of it, in my mind, has to do with this distinction that you alluded to, which is the, d the difference between kind of bravado, false bravado versus real confidence, which is, which is earned and experience-based. Confidence needs evidence. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, that's how you feed it. 
in my generation, I think we really screwed this up because we had this huge self-esteem movement. Yeah. And I remember elementary school, junior high, it's like, you know, you just get told you're great. But what the science actually shows is this, is that, you know, we don't get that like testosterone bump of like confidence unless we've done something to earn it. What a shocking thing to say. How dare you? <laughs> You're going to get canceled for that statement, Steve. You know that, right? <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. But but I I I, th I think this is like, it's it's so central to things because like, we get told the wrong idea so much. And instead, like we need to do the work. And it's not that you have a certainty about it, mm -hmm. but it's to know that, hey, I've prepared. Like I've put in the work, I've been consistent. Like my brain knows that I'm at least maybe not gonna fall apart if I enter the arena. Right. And how do you think about the difference between Extrinsic, extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation and rewards in the context of developing a healthy confidence. Yeah, so if you look at it, we're human beings. We're always going to have both, okay? But what you would like to have is the majority of your motivation should come from intrinsic, from the inside. It should be something that brings you joy, like love, all of that good stuff. Mm -hmm. If too much is on the outside, the external, it's kind of like that fear almost in that same response. It can work for a little bit and it tends to work for what I'd call easy things. So extrinsic works for like, hey, you know, am I going to get my kid to, I don't know, mow the grass? Sure, it'll work for that moment to get mm -hmm. them to mow the grass, but it won't teach them that this needs to be something to be, that you do. How to, be, how, how to make that motivation self-generated. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key is like, yes, every once in a while, you have to do rewards and all that stuff. But the ultimate goal is how do I take that and make it self-generated? Right. And if you can do that, you set yourself up to being able to do really hard things and be able to persist and enjoy it over the long haul. Right. An example that comes to mind um, that, that has a lot to do with embracing reality and, and where from whence your motivation comes is the situation where, take for example, you know, an objective sport where you're being measured with a clock, like track and field, in my case, swimming. You were somebody who at ninth grade, you had this you know, amazing breakthrough and then you just got faster and faster and faster and faster and then you plateau, right? If you want any longevity in sport, like this is in swimming, you can't, when you go to workout and you're doing your intervals and you're looking at the pace clock, early on, you're seeing improvement weekly or monthly and it's very encouraging. So I suppose that's an extrinsic yeah. motivator, like I'm on the right path. But at some point, as every athlete will tell you, like this stuff starts to plane out and you can't just go into workout every day expecting to be faster <laughs> than you were last week. Like you're just, you'll go insane. And that leads to kind of what you talked about, which is like, well, I just got to work harder. And I've just got, now I, do, I need to double my workload because I'm, I need to have that validation to know that I'm on the right path. So at some point you have to figure out a different relationship with how you're thinking about your progress and your improvement and your trajectory Otherwise, you're gonna you're gonna injure yourself or overtrain or burn out and quit the sport. Yeah, and a and lot. You of, must see this with your athletes all the time, right? Oh yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I mean, this is why I think young, like with with if you're a parent, if you're a coach of high school kids or youth athletes, your most important job is not to get them faster or have them, you know, do better or higher grades or whatever have you. Is to develop the joy of whatever pursuits they're doing. Give them the inner drive and develop that over the long haul. And if you can do that, like the rest takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. If they actually love the endeavor and the process that will supersede those short-term kind of dopamine hits about where you're at. And if you look at actually the research behind prodigies or phenoms and a wide variety from sports to academics to chess, um, the ones who make it are the ones who have higher levels of internal drive. Mm. The ones who don't make it, there's some fascinating research on this, that don't make it are often the ones that started out 
internally driven because they're really good at something early on. But then because of success, fame, pressure, parental pressure and expectations, coaching expectations, that our internal drive slowly shifted. Right. And and the the external is so heavy, right? It becomes an impossible responsibility to bear. It becomes a burden. Yeah. And when you you and what happens over the long haul is if that becomes a burden, then now you're playing not to lose, right? You're playing mm. like prevent defense. Fear-based. Ba- fear Fear-based. Fear yeah. Instead of like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what's going to happen. And uh, honestly, from my own experience as well is, you know, when I was chasing, trying to run under four minutes for a mile, over time, it inevitably became like, oh, like there's the clock. Like, am I on pace or am I yeah. off? Am I on pace or am I off? And the moment you're off, like it's like your brain goes up, oh, shut it down. Like we're done. Like stop competing. It's not worth it anymore. And that just becomes an instinctual reaction because you've trained it for so long that this number is what defines me. Mm-hmm. And that number could be in athletics or it could be your grades or your bank account or your fans or the number of Twitter followers. It becomes your higher you. power. Exactly. And you become a slave to it, yep. right? Which, which of course begs the question I have to ask you, which is, I know you still run, but why don't you run competitively? Like you could go out there and just kill it in whatever, you know, in the mile, in the marathon, in the half marathon, if you should choose to do so. So clearly there's an intentional, uh, you know, thought behind why you're not doing that. It's- Especially as somebody who didn't achieve their goal. Like those are the people who end up, turning into rabid masters athletes because they, you know, they feel like they, you know, I certainly part of my motivation, like they didn't, they didn't achieve the thing they thought they could back in the day. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. It's very intentional. It's because I know that if I go down that path, who I'm going to be. Uh huh. But isn't there an opportunity, especially if you read your own book to reframe that and develop a healthy relationship where it's driven by things like joy and just self-discovery. But what if I have, I have that, I have that <laughs> yeah. right now. Okay. And I think what I'm learning to do is I, I run every day. Uh-huh. I just don't train hard. But what I'm learning to do is experience what I get out of running, which for me is about once a week, I do a hardish workout. And mm-hmm. then about once a month, I run something pretty dang hard. There's no measure. Mm -hmm. there's no, like, I'm going to go run a 5k and try and break this time. It's, I'm just trying to experience like the discomfort and see if I can get through it Uh and see what that feels like. And there isn't just a little bit of like fear of like, why not just show up at the 10k? (laughs) (laughs) So, um, the turkey trot, our our mutual friend and my, my co-author on some of these books, Brad always bothers me. Yeah, well, Brad asked me to ask you this. That, that you know, yeah. this is not, not surprising. <laughs> but I, I don't, because I'm in a good spot with running. I, I enjoy it. I love getting out there. I love just kind of experiencing it and not having any burden so, whatsoever. Mm. And I think for so much of my life, there was a time, there was a clock, there was a race, there was a competition, there was this and expectations that not having those and just getting to experience it, it almost takes me back to like the early days. Yeah. Where I'm just kind of clueless. I get it. Like, no, oh. I get it. That's cool. That's I, 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 I completely get that. Like, I, I don't want to ever swim in an indoor pool again. Like, cause it just brings up, like, I did that. You know, I don't want to wake up in the dark to go to the pool. Like I did that. Like I do it cause it's fun and I enjoy it. And I like being out, you know, in the, under the sun and all that kind of stuff. And, but I'm still competitive, you know? So, there isn't a little, and, and, and like having something on the calendar just gives it a little bit more mm-hmm. structure, but then it does become a thing of like, remember you're doing this for the joy. Like who cares about the other stuff? Yeah. You know, who knows? You know. I'm getting up to 40. So maybe once the masters kick in, it'll, uh-huh. it'll rejuvenate my career and, <laughs> and you'll see me out there. Yeah. Uh, they're cranking with everybody else. But. I do think if you're being honest, something perhaps you're shrouding or to look at, and maybe I'm completely off base, is a fear that you have that if you were to to dip your toe back into it, that knowing yourself, 
it could become all-consuming and a distraction from the things that you currently care about. I, I, yeah, but no, the, I, but that is the opportunity for growth. Also, can you go back into it and not um, succumb to that? I think you're 100 yeah. percent correct. I mean, I think that's in there because, like, again, it was so much part of my identity, right? And so much of who I was or am that, of course, there's that fear of like, well, what would happen if I just like started training a lot? Mm -hmm. Would I go down that path where I was kind of obsessive about it? Mm -hmm. And I like to think of like, of course not. Like I'm, I'm older, I'm wise. Right. Well, there's a little denial there, right? Because you're like, yeah, that might happen. So I'm just going to pretend that doesn't exist and tell everyone that I'm really happy in my life and I do it for the joy. When it, in truth, there's like a, a weird dark shadow over here that as long as you don't go there, you don't really have to, you don't have to reckon with it. Yeah. No, yeah. I, 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 I 100%. <laughs> okay. I 100% agree. Okay. I think there, there's definitely that there. Um, well, let's, let's move to the, the, um, the second pillar, which is, which is all about listening to your body. I love this one. Yeah. So I think this is, this is again, one of those really important ones that we get backwards because we often get told like, hey, you know, ignore your feelings, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the science and the research, your feelings and emotions are almost like a messaging system. Mm -hmm. It tells us what's going on inside because there's no other way to like communicate that from like our muscles, brain, et cetera, to our conscious awareness. So our feelings and emotions kind of send that signal and give us something to do. But the key here is we got to be able to like communicate with it. We got to mm -hmm. be able to speak its language. And the athlete example I like to give, which we all understand is that as an athlete early on, you have to, you have to learn what is a pain that signals injury and what is a pain that signals, oh, that's just like some soreness and it'll go away and I'll be all right. Mm -hmm. The same thing applies to every other kind of emotion and feeling. And my wife is an elementary school teacher and she conveyed this great story that she said, you know, her kids who are throwing tantrums always like describe them with like a singular emotion. And it's very simple. It's like, I'm sad, right? Uh -huh. Why? Because they don't have the vocabulary or the understanding to break apart what that sadness is, whether it was frustration, whether it was insecurity driven, whatever it has, this myriad of things, they have to grow and develop that vocabulary to give them context. And if they do that, then they can't, they can handle it. When it's just like all these billions of, you know, emotions all funnel into this one word, one understanding, of course, they're going to throw a temper tantrum because right. they can't make sense of it. Right. But in this process and using athletics as an example, um, there is uh, a, a connection um, an integration that takes place with experience where you learn over time how to discern the difference between the niggle and the injury that, that you know, requires you to stop and attend to it. Um, and what's interesting and kind of ironic about that is athletes become so good at at, and so attuned to what their body is telling them. Like I can remember as a swimmer, I didn't need to look at the pace clock. If we were doing a set of hundreds, like I knew exactly what my heart rate was and I knew exactly when my finger hit the wall, like what my interval, like what, what time I did because you're so in touch with that. But, but um, the problem with that is that um, despite all of that, athletes can be expert at ignoring those signals. Like, you know, I'm feeling run down, you know, I should probably, you know, like wisdom would say, like, you should like ease, you know, take the foot off the gas, but that's like, no, I gotta, I need to do more. I need to push through this so I don't feel this way, or I'm not fit, or they won't taper, or they insist on, you talk about this in the book too, like, you know, running a whole bunch before a race or things like that, that are driven out of insecurity. Yeah. So it's not only, you have to be able to like communicate the same language, but then you have to have like the the security or the quiet confidence to be able to listen to what that mm -hmm. says. And I think that's where the expertise comes in is it's not just being able to, oh, I'm listening to my body. My body tells me this. No, you've got to be able to discern like what's real 
and then what's what I'll just call fake. And then security, right? From, oh, I don't want to taper because like I'll feel like I'm training less and I'm losing fitness. Well, you're not going to lose fitness in a week. It's not mm-hmm. going to happen. So it can't physiologically happen. That's the fake part. That's the insecurity talking. So you've really got to like meld this, listen to your body, plus this confidence to be able to discern like what's true and what's not. Right. And that puts the lie to the traditional idea of toughness. Like the, that, that idea would be like, I'm going to, you know, I just train harder than everyone. But if that's coming from a place of insecurity because you're afraid of taking a day off or allowing your body to heal, then that's not tough at all. That's just ignorant. Yeah. It's, you know, I always like to put it as, does the thing have the power or are you in control? Mm -hmm. And so much of toughness is like, do I have some semblance of control over things? Not complete control, but some semblance where I can influence it. So if the thing has all the control, if I can't step away from the run, say, hey, you know what? I'm a little sick and I've got a race coming up. So it's probably better that I rest. If I can't do that without like, that anxiety coming up, Mm -hmm. right? That should signal it's an issue that I need to be able to work with to sit with that discomfort so that the thing doesn't have the control and instead I'm making the wise decision and taking the action. Yeah, and the coach or the mentor or the leader has to understand how to instill that in the people that they're working with, right? So that's the difference between the controlling Bobby Knights out there who strip their athletes of of any agency or control versus the empowering coach who understands how to how to kind of um, seed that intrinsic motivation and that true confidence where the the athlete or the mentee is empowered to make their own decisions and feels like they have input into the trajectory of their career. The easiest way to make an athlete worse is to take away autonomy. Mm -hmm. Because like- And you think that goes back to the traditional versus the truth. Like, like if you just tell, like, this is what you do, do what I say, I'm going to make you a champion. I will completely control every aspect of your life. Like, you know, I don't know, Bella Caroli and these gymnasts, or you hear all these crazy examples. And, you know, they're successful in some regard. Those people don't tend to turn out to be completely, you know, um, well-rounded individuals, uh, but there are examples of that being successful. And yet that's really a wrong-headed approach. Yeah, because it's all it's doing is you're not training anything, right? You're training someone to respond to this single individual based on fear or punishment. But if you look at most sports, like it's not that the coach isn't out there with the athlete on top of them yelling and screaming and doing all that stuff. It's the athlete out there by themselves in mm-hmm. their head having to figure it out. If we take it outside of sport, like you're not worried about what your kids do when you look over them, right? When you're there in the house, yeah. you're worried about what happens when they go out into the world. Same in the workplace. So to me, it's it's pretty simple. It's like, yeah, that that like, dictating and controlling method might work if you're right over the top of them, but you want to train the ability. And in in order to do that, you have to give them a choice. Right. My favorite example in the book of that is, is what Kerr does with the Warriors when they're at the top of their game and they're winning everything. So tell that, tell that story. I think it's very instructive. Yeah. So it's the middle of one of their championship seasons and they were winning a lot. They were one of the best teams, obviously. And he looks around and he says, you know what? Like, ah, we're lacking a little something. So he goes in the, pre- in the pregame, like shoot around in the morning and says, guys, you're going to coach. I'm going to step back. You, 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 run the, you run the practice. You run the game. You call everything. I'm going to step back. And he just hands over the reins. Has anybody ever done that in the NBA before? I don't think in the NBA. Yeah. There wasn't an example that I could find of just turning it over to literally players, not player Mm -hmm. coaches, literally players to call it. But I think that's such an empowering thing because what is it? What message does it send? I trust you and it's up to you. Yeah, which is the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. It's saying, I trust you. I have my faith in you and you guys go show me you got it. Mm -hmm. You guys get the work done. Like 
I have the confidence in you. You want to talk about in, instilling trust and confidence? That's how you that's how you do it. Right? Because that's that's real. That's turning over those reins. That's saying, "Hey, I believe in you guys and let's see what you guys can do. I'm going to give mm-hmm. you a shot." Right. And so in the workplace, the analogy would be stop micromanaging and find ways to incentivize the people that are working underneath you um, and provide them with agency to make decisions and choices. Which goes against our natural inclination when things are tough and when things are going, you know, difficultly. Mm -hmm. Our natural inclination is like, oh man, I've got the answers. I've got to like control everything and do all this stuff. But it backfires. And if you look at, again, the research in the workplace is very clear. Google ran, you know, a study on teams that found that the number one thing in terms of team productivity was psychological safety. What is psychological safety? I can take risks to do my job. Right. And if I fail or fall short, I still have job security. Exactly. And so much, so much when we create the culture that is like, oh, like, fear-based or punishment-based or fear of losing your job, that doesn't make people tough or resilient. That makes people constrict so that they're in protective mode. Mm -hmm. They don't take the risks. They don't go for the innovation because why would they? If they do it and it fails, they lose a job. Right. They're just trying to figure out what does my boss want me to do so my boss will approve of this action rather than what is the most effective solution to this problem. Exactly. And what, what you often see, and this is actually a, a major problem in actually education, because they often micromanage and like dictate everything, is that people stop trying. Because if they know they're going to be like micromanaged, then they quickly figure out, okay, here are the boxes I need to check mm-hmm. to get the job done. And anything else like isn't wanted or won't get me anywhere. So I'm just going to fall to the level of the micromanagement. Right. You talk about that in the context of, of, of education. Teachers have to, they have this curriculum that's, you know, drilled down to 15 minute intervals. And basically there's no room for them to be creative and, to, you know, and to really express what inspired them to become teachers in the first place. Exactly. And that's probably why we have such a crisis in yeah. teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prophets walk among us. As a writer and podcaster for nearly 10 years, I've become more convinced than ever that our world is populated by scores of beautiful and brilliant people who have amazing stories to share. Those that we don't know who can teach us something new and leave us all the better for the experience of their sharing. And so I've dedicated my career to tracking down the most compelling prophets on the planet, going deep with each of them on my podcast, to elucidate the best of what they have to offer and to sharing the insights gleaned for the benefit of all. But the podcast is not the only medium by which to share their stories, which is why I'm proud to announce the release of my new book, Voicing Change, Volume 2. More than mere words on paper, Voicing Change is a physical manifestation of the magic, inspiration, and timeless wisdom that transpires each week on the Ritual Podcast. The first edition of Voicing Change was a beautifully rendered book worthy of display on any coffee table. And volume two follows in that tradition by showcasing even more of my favorite conversations in an elegant publication replete with interview excerpts, essays, and stunning photography, making for an exquisite companion to the first volume or a satisfying standalone work. Picking up this book allows you to revisit the wisdom of your favorite everyday prophets and physically interact with the life-changing ideas contained within. Voicing Change Volume 2, available now while supplies last for a limited time. Order your copy today only at richroll.com. Um, well, let's talk about the next one, which is which is res- learning how to respond instead of react. And uh, this is like at the crux of like the whole thing, right? We were talking about temper tantrums and the like. Like, how can you maintain your equanimity and your mindfulness under extreme pressure so that you can make the right decision and and kind of 
put yourself in the best position for the optimal outcome. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the crux of the whole thing from an individual level mm -hmm. is like, how do you keep, uh, uh, in the book, I like to call it is, how do you keep that alarm from spiraling out of control to a full freak out? And the way to do that is create space. Mm -hmm. It's not to bulldoze through, it's to create space so that you can navigate it. Because if you look at the science, it's pretty simple. It's, we tend to feel something, our inner dialogue starts to go. And then based on how loud those two things are, we're pushed or shoved towards an action. And we want that action to be something good and productive, but often what it is, is it's the easy path the choosing the candy instead of the vegetables mm -hmm. because we're just trying to escape this feeling uh, inner dialogue thought spiral. So how do we deal with that? We got to slow it down, create some space so that we don't have like the momentum of those two things, like feeling intertwined and feeling like, you know, once they spiral, it's out of control and we can't do anything. Right. So this is where mindfulness practices come in because you're talking about like if you're if you're talking about an athlete, um, you're talking about, you know, nanoseconds. Yeah. So creating how do you create space when you're in a situation of flow and you have to just, you know, kind of intuitively move in the right direction and not react and fall prey to, you know, some kind of base emotion that's going to make you make the wrong decision. Right. So creating space is a habit, a practice that we can cultivate through these more Eastern influenced modalities. Um, but uh, at the same time, like I'm thinking about something you talked about earlier in the book, which is, you know, when we're pushed up against the wall, we have this hormonal flight or fight response, right? And 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 you kind of put the put the lie to that in that it is not binary in the way that we've thought about it. Like it isn't an either or thing. It's actually a much more complex um, kind of happening that's going on there. Yeah, your brain is predictive, so it's trying to figure out the the best solution based on the 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 history it has, and then the situation in front of you. So it's not fight or flight. It's we can, we can run away, we can escape, we can find a friend to protect us, we can like to protect our young, we can like find community. There's all these variations of responses that that come with it. And each has its own kind of like hormonal milieu that that mm -hmm. that like comes with it. So to me, it's about matching the right response with the right situation. And how you do how do you do that over time? You got to train your body just like we would or train your mind just like we would our body to like default towards this response in these situations. So walk me through how you practice that and how you preach practicing that with the athletes that you work with. Yeah. So with the athletes I work with, a lot of times I call it as let's practice having a calm conversation, which means I'm going to put you in a situation that is incredibly uncomfortable. And then I want you to learn to sit with it and then use various strategies, which we can talk about, to figure out how to create space. Mm -hmm. Those strategies could be everything from visualize, self-talk, talking out loud. It could be like zooming out and shifting your perspective, your attention, any number of things, bunch of them. And in terms of putting themselves in an uncomfortable situation, we can do that, if I'm talking runners, you can do it in a workout, but you can do that anywhere. You could hop in an ice bath. You could go to a coffee shop and you're shy and don't want to talk to your neighbor. You can go sit there and talk to your neighbor. Anything that makes you uncomfortable is an opportunity to, cr to train your mental muscle to be able to like sit with that and navigate that. Mm -hmm. And the science shows that if you practice that, you develop a capacity to recall that under duress in situations that aren't necessarily related or analogous to, you know, going into the coffee shop. It, exactly. It's essentially all you're doing. We'll simplify the neuroscience a lot, but you have an area in your brain called the amygdala, which is threat, 
processing area. It's like the alarm signal, right? Whenever mm -hmm. something, your brain thinks something bad is going to happen, amygdala goes up. You have the prefrontal cortex, which is what I'd call like the controller. It's like the rational part that's job is to dampen down that amygdala and say, hey, everything's good. Mm -hmm. Don't have to worry about it. Anytime we can train our prefrontal cortex to send the message, hey, amygdala sending the alarm, everything's good. Like, don't freak out. It ingrains that pathway where you have this stronger emotional control. But the, the opposite occurs too, right? Right. If you train your brain to react all the time, it's going to react all the time. That, that sensor is going to be hypersensitive. You know, in, outside of all these performance worlds, what do we often do in our world of, let's say, social media? We train our brains to react, our amygdala to go off, even at the slightest hint of like, oh, that, that was kind of off, mm -hmm. you know? So I think we have a world, and that's just one example, but we have a world that trains us to almost see everything as a threat. And we have to fight back against that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if you look at also that threat response tends to be amplified with anybody who feels exhausted or burned out. Yeah, 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 yeah. How does that work or mesh with flow states? So obviously, you know, every athlete aspires to be in that state where it's almost uh, an experience of no mind where you're just in the, in the process of doing what you do and doing it as best as you can do, where <clears throat> a pause to reflect before responding is by definition an interruption of, that is a non-flow experience, right? So in training, you're trying to acclimate the athlete to the experience of flow, right? But how do those two things, I guess, I guess in a soup, like an intervening event would disrupt the flow and then it becomes about like respond or react. Yeah, so this, I'm glad you brought up this up because this was one of my favorite topics to talk about. So flow is great. Okay, we all desire to be in flow. It's wonderful. If you're in flow, your job is to stay in flow. Okay, so whatever you need to do to stay in flow, and actually some of the research shows in terms of attention, is distraction will actually help you stay in flow. Oh, really? That's counterintuitive. It is. So if you look at golfers, for example, when they're in flow, they'll often talk to their caddy more to keep their mind off of everything else that they're actually doing. Yeah, because if they doing. start thinking about what they're doing, then they, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so it keeps you in that, that state. Okay, so if you're in flow in that state, whatever works there. But that's where these tools help, right? If you have the ability to, what I call zoom in and zoom out, like distract yourself or really deep down and get super focused, if you train that ability, when you're in flow, you have the ability to distract yourself a little bit productively. Mm -hmm. But we're not always, the other part of it is we're not always going to be able to get in flow. Flow generally occurs when it's what's called a just manageable challenge. And physiological arousal levels are moderate. Mm -hmm. So if we can keep our arousal levels high, relatively high, but within check, we can get in flow. If for whatever reason, our nerves, anxiety, pressure, et cetera, get our arousal levels up high, super high, we can't get in flow. Mm. So we need to be able to do something when we're in situations where like those arousal levels are through the roof. And what the science and research and psychology says there is that you can enter what's called a clutch state, which is essentially, instead of flow is like letting it happen, clutch is like you have to make the decision to make it happen. Mm. And there it's like you need... Again, similar tools, but now instead of distraction, zooming like out, you have to zoom in while not losing your mind because you're super like, right. you know, adrenaline's going nuts. Right. So the clutch state also, I suspect, can be trained by placing yourself in stressful situations and trying to recall these mindfulness practices to provide space, right? So it's something you can train for. And I love the idea between the zoom in and you use like Frank Shorter and marathoning versus the zoom out, which is the fighter pilot that has to like take into account like all these things that are going on because it's, he's 
confronted with all these dials and switches and he can't just focus on one thing in order to make the right decision in that clutch experience. It, exactly. That's one of the things that was really fun um, researching and writing about is because again, there's nuance and maybe this is what the, the message of the book is, is like the more sk skills or tools you have in the tool belt, the more you're able to match one of those tools with whatever situation like you face. Mm -hmm. So in the example you just gave there, like Frank Shorter, the marathoner, had to zoom in and get really focused. If you're a, if you're a fighter pilot, like you have to zoom out so you can pay attention to all these things because like when danger is happening, you your mind tends to narrow in on the like one little beeping buzzing thing. And the research shows that even if something else is like beeping and buzzing, you don't hear it which can be really dangerous if you're in a in a like dangerous situation in the in the air. Right. So you right, got to right. train your mind to zoom back out even though it's telling you like focus on this one dial that is wrong. Right. That's fascinating. Yeah, because if you're thinking about marathoning like just focus on your breath. Like pick one thing as a metronome to crowd out all of the pain pain and whatever other things that can be distraction so you can just execute on the one thing. But that's very different from a rapidly developing and potentially dangerous situation where you're being attacked by lots of different things and you have to do some really rapid mind work to figure out what where your attention is best placed. Exactly. It, attention is a tool. It's a trainable tool. And I think too often we just kind of let it happen. Mm -hmm. But training it happens when you're deliberate about it. Right. So how do you train it to know when you need to zoom in and when you need to zoom out? Yeah. So, so you're this... not just prey to whatever your brain is <laughs> wants to do, right? <laughs> yeah. So so here I think this comes down to like practice, right? Uh-huh. Is to use the fighter example, what do they do? They go in simulators, right? And they have all these alarms buzzing and beeping, et cetera. And they have someone watching and essentially coaching them up. And if you miss an alarm, well, what does that tell you? You needed to zoom out in that situation and you didn't because you didn't hear that other alarm. But what if you're zoomed out and you're just hearing lots of bells and you're just taking it all in and what you really needed to do was figure out how to zoom in on the right thing? Yeah, that's why they have the checklist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right? I mean, that that's, that's uh -huh. the reason. But I, I think in other pursuits, it's, you know, when I'm coaching runners, what often happens, and I did some research on this actually, is what we focus on in practice is entirely different than what we focus on in a race. So in practice, we know we're going to make through it. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to get on the other side, right? It's challenging, but it's no one's watching. It doesn't matter. So what we tend to think of is, yeah, we're focused on the work, but we'll think of, oh, what am I you know, going to have for lunch? What am I doing later with Johnny or Susie? Like there's more distracting thoughts of, of that stuff. In a race, there's almost none of that. So in practice, we're training our brain to like get through this workout by sometimes occasionally thinking about like the future and distracting us. Mm -hmm. But that's not where, what we're facing in a race. So instead of seeing practice just as, hey, I need to hit these times on this workout to get things done, you need to see it as what's my psychological or mental goal? What tool am I training? And actually, one of my really good athletes in college, Brian Barraza, who's went on to run professionally, he called it, some practices I need to let my mind go to a bad place and then see if I can figure my way out. Mm. And if I can't, if I fall apart, then that tells me that I didn't have the right tools to use and I've got to develop those tools. So an example of that would be what? Like, like let's say you're doing, I don't know, 400 repeats or whatever, like just run the first hundred meters way too fast. So then you're like, you know, you would never do that in a race, but what would I do in this situation where I've overexerted too early on? Put yourself in a hole. Yeah, exactly. Like you put yourself in a hole and then now you have to like get, get out of that because like you can't just quit. You're just not going to stop. So like, how do you get out of that situation, which is not, you know, comfortable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, let's talk about the last one, which is it, the last pillar, transcending discomfort. I mean, this is sort of like the global thing, right? Like, 
how can you inoculate yourself or that's the wrong word how can you um just create a habit of 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 exposing yourself to difficult things and increasing that difficult level of difficulty gradually over time yeah so this was probably you know one of the funnest sections or the funnest section to because it like pulls out from the individual and says, okay, what's the global thing, as you said? And it's kind of like surprising, but it, it kind of isn't. But it's like, well, if you fulfill people's basic psychological needs and you combine that with meaning, people can handle really difficult things. And what are those basic psychological needs? Competency feeling like I can make progress and grow in whatever I'm doing. Autonomy, which we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. like feeling like I have some sort of control over things and belonging. Do I belong to this group? Do I feel a part of this? Is this bigger than myself? And you combine that with meaning, meaning is this endeavor or this thing I'm getting through that is really hard? Is it more than just for a paycheck or for whatever whatever it is. Yeah. So as a coach or as a leader in the workplace, like how do you cultivate those things so that your team can do the best they can do? So I think this is where we often get it wrong. What do we do in the workplace? We often come up with core values and slogans. Yeah. We put them on the wall. <laughs> And then we say, look at those with things. A, with a picture of, you know, like, a, uh, like a crew rowing a boat. Yeah, you yeah know, like, exactly. You know. It's like the stock photo. Yeah. And it's like, look at these things. So motive, so inspired. This is the problem. They're not authentic. People know, right? Mm -hmm. People like understand our brains can tell real from fake. So if it's not authentic, it's not going to work. So the, the best thing that you can do as a leader to create resilient teams is to be authentic and support people in a way that helps them be authentic in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about you know autonomy, belonging, all of these things, well, you have to actually want those, number one. And then number two, you have to lead by example, by setting the stage. And I think there's some brilliant examples in sport. One that I talk about in the book is, you know, Greg Popovich, the famous coach for the San Antonio Spurs. How does he create belonging? Well, well, before getting there, actually, I'll tell a story, then I'll get to there. Um, he creates belonging by inviting all the players to these like well thought out dinners where he takes the time to pick the food, He's a wine expert. He picks the wine. He arranges the tables in the right way with the right people to kind of create this natural conversation. Because how do we create belonging? It's not through like trust falls and like random exercises. Right. It's through genuine connection. What Popovich does brilliantly is he creates the space for genuine connection. And it's something that he's passionate about. He loves food. He loves wine. So people get excited about it. But he doesn't let them choose the wine or the food. No, he doesn't. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But here, here's what happened, okay? I've, I've worked with a couple of NBA teams. And after this kind of story broke, they'd be like, Steve, we tried team dinners. No one showed up. Uh -huh. Be like, you're missing the picture. The dinner isn't the thing. It can be an avenue. But the thing is, Popovich was really passionate about this and created the environment where people wanted to be and wanted to connect. Because it was authentic to what he was inspired by. Exactly. Yeah. Like, find that thing for you, whatever it is, and it will, it uh -huh. will like coalesce and help people. Right. I'm just imagining the, you know, the chief financial officer, you know, who's into birding, making his team go birding with him. <laughs> You know, it, you know, it, it might go sideways. It might go sideways. Yeah. You know, it has to be something people generally like to do. But I, I do think it's like that, that, that passion is contagious and opens up an avenue. Uh -huh. But the, the bottom line is, it's again, very simple. It's be authentic. And the yeah. other thing that I think is important and that I've found in the research is that 
we often think that we have to um we have to like establish trust and then be authentic and vulnerable but it's the opposite we have authenticity to, breeds trust exactly yeah. mm -hmm. right is we is you don't get that that trust without the authenticity right you have to take the leap of faith so that the person sitting across from you says oh man like that person is taking that leap. Yeah. I'm going to do that with them. And authenticity demands vulnerability. And this is where it gets tricky because leaders and athletes have been, you know, a nerd to that idea. Like we've been taught since the beginning, don't show weakness, right? Where ultimately greater strength is mined through the exploration of vulnerability, but it's a counterintuitive principle for a lot of leaders and high achievers. Exactly. And I think the other part is, is it's like, once you've, if you're a high achiever, you're a leader, you're a CEO, like you've been taught those things and you've also kind of grown into this hierarchy where it's almost like you have to learn how to put your ego aside as well, which mm -hmm. is a very difficult thing. Yeah. Because you're known as the CEO, this guy who has the answers, all this good stuff. And now you have to say, you know what, I'm going to put my quiet down my ego so that like, we can share things that might be real and difficult and hard. Right, because the delusion is that by expressing that vulnerability that you'll degrade the trust that you've created. But ultimately, as we just talked about, that authentic expression of vulnerability will engender even greater trust. Exactly. But it's, it's, it's a risk. It's, it's, it's scary. It is. And, and, and that's where, you know, I call this book Do Hard Things because I think part of it is, you know, and you talked about this even with myself and running is that the growth comes from the discomfort. It's in there. Mm -hmm. If you can go in there, navigate it and figure out how to come out on the other side. Right. And the beautiful thing is you see this cover and you're like, do hard things. Like you think you're going to read this book about like, here's how I'm going to, you know, go to seal camp and make it through. And it's like, no, for any athlete, they know, they already know, like, Doing the hard thing is the easy thing when it comes to the practicality of the training. If anything, we need to hold ourselves back. Like that's not the issue that needs throttling. The real hard thing, the hard thing that we need to do is the more nuanced um, approach to all of this that requires these challenging and frightening emotions to be called forth, such as vulnerability and authenticity and mindfulness and all of this kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. The things that we think are hard aren't right. actually the hard exactly. things. Exactly. That's the succinct way of yeah. <laughs> putting what I just said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's, so it's kind of like a Trojan horse in that regard. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Well, the book is amazing. Um, before I let you go though, I, there are like a couple things that I wanted to ask you about, not the least because it's sort of been um, top of news right now, which is, uh, the fact that this six-year-old ran a marathon last week and the, the, the internet is not, you know, uh, speaking kindly of, <laughs> of what just occurred. Yeah, I was- Is that the youngest person who's ever done a sanctioned marathon? I think it is. Yeah. That's the youngest what one. What was going on here? You know, I'm not the parent, but I can tell you, and I think Kara Goucher said this very well, this isn't gonna help the child. It didn't seem like, and I don't know, and I, I didn't dive too deeply into this, but it does seem like the kid wasn't really that enthusiastic. It's not like it was intrinsically driven by this kid's desire to do this. It was more coming from the parents. So if you look at it, the parents are, are runners. They have this thing where they do all these races with their, I think they have six children. Didn't they do the Appalachian Trail yeah. or something? Uh -huh. So. It's a running family, et cetera, which is, which is fine, whatever. But if you're a six-year-old, you have to put it, you have to put your mind in that, that six-year-old. A six-year-old doesn't have the choice. They don't know what they're getting into. What they probably see, and it took them like eight hours to run the marathon. So they obviously weren't trained, although I don't know how you train a six-year-old. But right. what you see here is most likely is pretty simple. You have a kid who sees all his siblings participating in these races. You have a fam you have parents who participate in these races with the family and you know 
video them for YouTube and all that stuff. And you just have a kid who probably wants attention, support, love, et cetera, like any child wants. Mm -hmm. And the path towards that looked like probably running a marathon. Right. It doesn't necessitate an explicit pronouncement from the parent like we expect you to do yep. this. It's just implied because this is what we do as a family. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where I think it, it's really dangerous because like, again, as a parent, you have to be like, and I'm not one, so I'm not trying to speak for any, but I've seen and worked with athletes who had similar, very young experiences in running an endurance sport. And it creates this weird kind of identity cementation around things and this weird, like, this is how I get approval from my parents. Mm -hmm. And this is where that comes from. And that's a very dangerous game to play. We're not even talking about the physical ramifications of a six-year-old running a marathon. I just think from a psychological standpoint, that's a very dangerous game to play. And I think it's concerning and you're seeing more and more of it in the age of social media, Instagram, et cetera, where parents don't realize the expectations, the psychological baggage they're placing on their young kids from like mm -hmm. projecting, using their children for their athletic pursuits. Yeah, and I think it's important to point out that that nobody's nobody's implying a you know nefarious motive on on behalf of the parents it's just a lack of awareness around this exactly it's it's you know you see this at every sport you see it in the little leagues like soccer parents or what have you baseball parents um i see it all the time as i sit, said my wife's a elementary school teacher mm -hmm. and i get invited to these games with her and she drags me along to her classes and it's the wildest crap i've ever seen it drives me nuts just you mean like screaming parents screaming and parents thing. parents right. of like 5 year olds yelling at refs and you're just like <laughs> it's a youth soccer like or yeah. youth tag football game like uh -huh. chill out but you know one of the interesting thing i was i was talking to a former uh well teammate of mine we ran on the same club team um, Lindsay Gallo, who was NCAA champion at Michigan in the 1500. And she made this nice comment. She said, you know what, Steve? I have kids now. I have a bunch of friends who, you know, used to run college at a high level. They're on the sideline and they're chilled out. They're not yelling at their kids. They're not worried if the kid wins or loses or whatever. And we had this nice conversation where it's like, I, I've seen the same thing. Because if you've been through the crucible, you've been to a relatively high level, you know what it takes, you know what the psycholo psychology is, you know that like basically, and this is me, coming from me and coaching, the parent can either get in the way or they can just kind of support and allow them to flourish. Mm -hmm. And so many think, like, oh, if I do this, this, and this, they get in the way. But I'll tell you from a, co a college coaching standpoint, I had more than a handful of parents and they're good people. It's not that they're bad people. They want the best for their kid. I had more than a handful of parents who I had to tell, hey, can you not show up at the conference championship? <laughs> because, because the kid would freak out because yeah. they have expectations. And it's not like the yeah. parent was intentionally doing that. No, 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 no. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty crazy. It's wild. and it is funny, you know, just being when you when you become a parent and you go to all those events. Like, yeah, if you if you've come up in athletics, particularly athletics at a high level, like you're just not the person doing that unless you had a very unhealthy experience with that. The people that are screaming and yelling tend to be people who were not athletes or had a very frustrated experience with athletics and are projecting onto their kids some kind of unfulfilled, you know, hope and dream. Exactly. If I had yeah. one message to parents, it would be chill out. Yeah. Like on your on your athlete. And I have this debate with my wife all the time, who is also a, a very, she was all American in, in, in track in, um, in college. And we have this debate all the time. We're like, do we really want our, our kid to be like a, a runner or, or not? Just because mm -hmm. it's like, do you want that like expectation? And how would we handle that? And we're always just like, 
hands off, like no coaching, like you do you, like whatever you want to do, you want to run great. You want to play soccer or join math club, doesn't matter. And I think that's because we've both like been through that crucible of like, ah, like it's great. Don't get me wrong, but you've got to be the one who chooses to do it. Well, let me, let me put you at ease a little bit as somebody who's been in the parenting game for, for a while. Like your decision as to whether or not you want your kid, if you end up having a kid to go into running is really not something you need to concern yourself with because your kid will let you know. Like they, <laughs> they don't, it's like, they're their own people. Yep. They don't come from you, they come through you. And they're a little bit more baked than you presume in terms of the nature versus nurture thing. Yeah, so I love that. They tend to be very different than what you expect. And that becomes your own personal kind of growth experience with them as your teachers. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, one final thing though, because people are gonna kill me that I have, if I don't, like I've got this elite track and field marathon coach sitting across from me and I have not even asked anything about like, you know, how to be a better runner for all the people that are listening to this, thinking that they're gonna get tips on, you know, for their next marathon. So maybe we can round this out with just a few thoughts on where you see the average, you know, marathon or half marathon or type person kind of go astray and where you think that their attention should be better focused. And this is obviously in the most general yeah, terms. Yeah, but. very open-ended. So what I would, I would say is this, um, I see the, the general marathon, half marathoner, they train too hard, they go too hard on their easy days. Mm. They overcook it on the easy days and don't go slow enough. Right. I just got dragged on the internet over the past couple of days for something I posted like last October, where I posted that little clip of the Kenyans, you know, doing their shuffle. And I was like, slow days are for going slow. And it's them running like extremely slow. Right. Yeah. And for some reason in the last couple of days, this, this tweet resurfaced and a bunch of people are, are angry or they're shit. There's like a, a divisiveness of opinion about this because I think there is, maybe you know more about this than I do, but there was a track and field coach who was tweeting a lot about how, you know, we over index on the slow miles and like that shouldn't really be considered training and blah, blah, blah. And a bunch of co coaches piled on him and said, no, that's not true. So there seems to be a little bit of a Twitter controversy around slow days and what that means and the appropriateness of, you know, what is kind of pejoratively called junk miles, but which I think are important. So maybe a few thoughts on that to oh, clear man. this up from your perspective. Yeah, you're gonna throw me into the the social media Twitter mayhem. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Do you know what I'm talking about yeah, though? Oh, you're, oh, yeah. you're aware of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh okay. yeah, the controversies right. in running. We argue over yeah. the weirdest things. Um, so here, here's what I would say is that there's no doubt in longer distance stuff, aerobic development is key. And for most of us, that aerobic development takes a really long time, or for everyone, it takes a really long time. And the key is how much easy running can I accumulate safely? So your slow, easy days. And what does easy actually mean? So here's my, I'll give you the simple okay. answer. You should be able to have a conversation like we're having here. Mm -hmm. If now, don't get me wrong, you can, shouldn't be able to like have a conversation, not breathe, but you should be able to have a relatively normal conversation. If you start having what I'd call a, a texting conversation, you're going too fast. Uh -huh. So that's how I kind of frame it. And I think if you look at that, and you're doing it in a, and again, whatever you can handle, easy days are, are great. Are you going to need more than that? Of course. Like the intensity stuff matters, mm -hmm. of course. But it's like the, the icing on top of the cake that like is vital. Like you need it for the, the cake to taste good, but you don't need like as much as you would to bake the cake, right? The ingredients to bake the cake. So to me, it's like we argue over these things. And, and the, I'll give the historical example. 
to maybe help this out is now is way back in the day we used to argue over whether we should walk for a really long time or do interval training on the track for seven days a week mm-hmm. in the 1920s 30s 40s right. that, w- that was the debate <laughs> really long walks or on the track smashing 200s every day uh-huh now no one's debating that now we're debating over this like middle ground where everyone agrees you have to run a decent amount of easy stuff. Everyone agrees you have to occasionally go hard. And the advice I'd, I'll leave your listeners to, which is like, you know, it's like my little haiku of running, which is like lots of easy running, occasionally go hard, very, very rarely go see God. Mm-hmm. which means like go to the well so that you know what it means. Right, 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 right. I think that's wise advice. My sense is that people don't have the quiet confidence that you talk about in the book to do to go slow on the slow days. Um, and that's part and parcel of why this is debate like, oh, you know, I can't afford to go slow because I'm not fit enough or they don't trust in their training plan or their coach or what or, or what have you or they don't understand just what slow actually means. And on those harder days and hard days, they're not going hard enough. So they're not really training the polarities. They're just kind of in this perpetual gray zone. And then they're confused when they plateau and can't break through that plateau. Yeah, I I think I I agree 100%. I think Mm -hmm. it takes security to run easy. Yeah. Like it takes the confidence. How dare you? Well, don't at Steve, don't (laughs) at me on that. Just, you know... (laughs) Put that in your pipe and smoke it and do with it what you will. Um, Pleasure to talk to you. I'm really excited for this book to come out and be birthed into the world. You're doing the world a service. I think you did the right thing by graduating from your uh, tenure at University of Houston to make yourself more available to people like myself. So I thank you for that. And I can't wait to see what this new chapter brings. The book is great. It's called Do Hard Things. You can find it everywhere. Comes out June 21st, available for, I don't know when this is going out. Maybe it'll be out, maybe it won't. We'll figure that out. Um, And where else do you want to have people find you? The growth, we didn't even talk about the growth equation. I talked about that with Brad. That's a newsletter and podcast that you do with Brad Stolberg. Um, Where can everybody find what you're putting out into the world? Yeah, you can go to thegrowtheq.com. You can go to stevemagnus.com or find me on any social media at Steve Magnus, just don't don't yell at me. Yeah, for getting easy getting into days. fights with other track coaches <laughs> about zone two and the like, right? All right, um, we'll come back and talk to me again. Until then, uh, it's great talking to you, man. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rich. Right on. Peace. Lions.